that right. you, there we go so everyone what comes, <laughs> yes everyone can hear you but you're currently uh spinning around the moon and back uh majids so welcome to Jade, welcome to Sepake, welcome to everyone we have here in the room, the University of the Underground students or alumni, but also friends of the University of the Underground. We are a free pluralistic transnational uh, charity, uh, which is all about basically trying to bring pluralistic uh, thinking into practices. Uh, we also are with Majid, Ia Majid. Do you want to try and introduce yourself and the Union of Justice? Hi. Jade? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Majid. I'm um, one of the non executive directors at Tordy Moon, as well as a board member of uh, University of the Underground Fund and director of the Union of Justice as well as lots of other things. And a bit of a visual description. I am wearing a beige cap facing forward, a gray hoodie and a interesting looking background basically. And just want to say a massive welcome to everybody. To kick things off, um, just first of all, just remind everyone that we are recording and uh, this session. And if anyone wants to uh, have access to the live transcript, you can click on the button at the bottom to have access to that. Just to kick things off, I want to just share with you all a really, really wonderful, amazing opportunity. So here we have an incredible opportunity where we're giving away lots of money and giving people the opportunity to get funded to make a new creative project and actually feature in the festival. So may maybe you want to create an immersive film, we can give up to £25,000 each. Or maybe and you want to create a piece of digital artwork, we can we can fund that as well. Or maybe writing's more your style. We can also and um, you want to write a short play, you want to DJ, submit like you want to contribute to Zine. Literally, there's so much amazing opportunities. So please do share this with as many people as possible. And and yeah, if you want to uh, know more about it, I'll put and if you go on toddymoon.com forward slash apply. All the details are basically on there. Right, and um, this wonderful session titled, How to Embed Care in Your Practice. And uh, we've got the wonderful Sepaka Anigiyama and Jade Monstrat. And I'm sure I've butchered both your names, so sincere apologies. And I'll allow you guys to introduce yourselves and shortly. So if you can, and, um, We'll start off with um, Jade. And uh, Jade, if you can, you know, like visually introduce yourself and, and verbally let us know a bit more about your work. And if you kind of just want to kind of just kick off and then you can speak for a while and then we'll kind of um, go into uh, Sepake. But yeah, feel free to introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Majid. Um, it's good to meet you all. Um, and My name is Jade Montserrat and I am a brown woman with my hair tied back and um, I've recently in the last two days enjoyed using a background. Normally for Zoom I have the same background which is some bookshelves in the hovel that I reside in in Whitby. And um, yesterday for um, the role that I'm, I'm sort of participating in um, with Cooper Gallery, which is um, a gallery attached to the university, um, Duncan Georgenston, is that uh, DJ, DJ CAD in Dundee. Um, I'm the associate occupier or artist occupier for their more recent um, exhibition called Sit In Number Two, the Ignorant Art School. And yesterday I did a... So um, I um, hosted my first event and they wanted me to use a visual background. Um, from their exhibition because I'm not, gonna, I'm not in Dundee and it was to give a, a, a picture of um, this extraordinary installation charting um, 
uh, yeah, just decades long from the birth of the foundation course um, um, uh, to now um, and alternative pedagogies and art education in any case. So this evening I thought, oh, I'll use a visual background. So I have one. And unfortunately, um, it's one of my text based watercolors. And I haven't quite mastered the skill of using a visual background. So the, um, the letters are the wrong way around, they're mirrored. So it's um, illegible probably, unless you've got a mirror. Um, and the right way around for us, Jade. Oh, oh, that's, well, that's good. It's, it's confusing for me because I was trying to, yeah, do flipping, but it, I, it's, I can't read it. It's a mirror for me. Um, so that's, that's really good. It's a drawing from um, the exhibition that Sepake and I worked on together at Manchester Art Gallery. And that gives you an indication of what I'm about. I'm an art, a visual artist and educator. What I can see, I think it says, prone and bound with compassionate ass something. Your back's covering, I, I can't see the rest of it, but uh, feel free. Oh, with compassionate assistance, prone and bound with compassionate assistance. That's what it says. And Sepake, do you want to briefly just um, introduce yourself yeah. and uh, let people know the work that you do? And Yes, yeah, so um, Jade, thanks for joining um, me this evening. So I... Oh, by way of introduction, maybe I'll start off by saying how I know Nelly. So I went to um, the Royal College of Art to study curating. But before doing that, I had been working in lots of different educational settings. So like I worked in uh, what we call a pupil referral unit, which is where they send <laughs> school kids who um can't really deal with like school settings um i used to work as a primary school teacher i worked um in community centers with women with mental health um i worked in um youth centers so i worked in lots of different places and mostly and always with artists um, just because I always felt that um, when you work with artists or when you work with art or when you work creatively, it allows you to access um, a different way of being in the world. So um, I decided then, I think after a project went really horribly wrong while I was working at the Hayward Gallery, they... I was a educator and they were like, oh, who's the curator on this project? And I said, oh, there isn't a curator, it's just me, I'm the educator. And they were like, no, there needs to be a curator. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went off and <laughs> to find out what all this curating was about. So I did a curating course. And then um, since then I've worked in mostly, to be honest, museums or galleries or what I call, um, more expanded ways of thinking about the gallery or the museum. So it might be working with artists in the city, but it'll probably be within a, a festival or an art biennial, like an expanded exhibition. Um, yeah, so I am a black woman wearing an African or Thai, never really sure which one, um, or Indonesian um, batik um as a head wrap um i've got afro hair and i'm wearing a gray um sweat uh, uh jumper and behind me i've got a <laughs> a crazy patterned wall a floral patterned wall which is actually if you feel it it's actually flock it um so it's fur a little bit furry very popular in the 80s but I'm bringing it back. Um, and it on the wall, there are two two um, pictures. One is a photograph of someone who's flopped over a large uh, ball 
inflated ball and the other one is of a um a matador um from a painting i think the painting's called the dead man so i think the bull won um and he's lying on the floor looking very well dressed but i think he's dead brilliant thank you so much and um, in fact if anyone has got any flat wallpaper please feel free to kind of let us know in the chat box. I'll be interested to know if anyone's got any sort of flocked things on their walls. So guys, so yeah, um, I guess this is just to both um, yourselves, Sepaki and Jade. It's, I guess the topic is how to embed care in your practice. Because there'll be many artists, friends as well, there'll be many artists that'll be watching um, the video afterwards. So I guess, what like so when when we say how do we embed care in, into your practice it'd be great to kind of know in in how many ways we can embed practice into our work kind of thing so i know it's a very wide topic basically but i guess in your experience first and foremost Sapakia, whether that be a curator or just working with artists why do you think it's important for artists to actually embed care as part of their practice and not some not something that they have to think of afterwards, but it comes part and parcel with the work. So I think, first of all, maybe it's important to think about uh, what do we mean by the word care? Because there might be people um, in this room who are carers themselves, um, care providers and caregivers for other people, maybe in their family. Um, and so the kind of care I'm going to talk about is um, the care that we what, that I'm addressing is really maybe care around a work practice, um, and that's not to say that it um, is not sometimes personal, but um, uh, it's also thinking maybe also a little bit about um, the word care, which is embedded in words like curator as well. Um, so so that's the kind of care maybe that I'm going to talk about. And I, I guess the kind of care that's embedded, firstly, I guess, within um, and the idea of being a curator is the kind of care that is exercised, I think, to um, primarily people think about uh, care of um, artwork. Um, and it's quite interesting because... Um, Think through working with Jade, it's quite interesting to think about not just the care of an artwork or even the care of the artist, but also the care of narratives. So um, how do you um, embed care uh, in your work that not only um, recognises um, the importance of the work that you want to do together, but also recognizes the way that you talk with one another when you're when you're trying to do that work. So that was something I found really um, striking in the way um, Jade uh, works is that I found working with her there was a real care around how we spoke with one another. Amazing. Thank you very much. What about you, Jayla? Like, how would you uh, not define care, but in terms of like responding to the kind of theme of how to put care in your work, like, how, how would you tackle that? Thank you. I think, um, thank you, Sepeke. And also for, yeah, you, your observations around how we work with one another, how I think I would tackle thinking about embedding care in one's practice um, is through exchange and um, I suppose allowing everyone's needs to be heard and seen um 
yeah, at that very basic level, as an initial step, it's and trying to understand one another's needs, and that can be in the work environment, or it can be applied in um, caring um, workers' roles as well. I think it's um, universal um, being able to communicate with one another and access our needs. Um, yeah, I think that's how I tackle maybe um, trying to understand how to carefully approach um, everything I'm doing. So that then becomes practice um, and a mode of operating. Um, then as a methodology um, to be applied at any point in work and life. Hmm. Definitely. And Sepake, I guess one of the things you kind of touch upon as well as like taking care of your artwork and taking care of yourself, you said it's also really important to take care of, narr of the narrative kind of thing. So say if there's some, I'm sure there's some emerging artists and that are joining us today as well as be watching later on, but how can an emerging artist that's just trying to like finally like getting a start thing, how can they best take care of their narratives? Is there any kind of like practical, practical things they can do? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the reason why I mentioned about taking care of narratives is because you have to imagine also um, that you're not always going to be there to tell the narrative around your artwork or whatever you're putting into the world. In actual fact, um, I was just thinking about an artist who once told me um, that it, for him it was really important to embed forms of resistance in his work so that it could never be misconstrued or used in uh, a way that um, uh, that used in a way uh, that he didn't want it to be used in. So I guess I'm thinking about um, the fact that, you know, we all, um, when we come to, to an artwork or an object or something in the world, we're going to have our own interpretation of what we think we're seeing. Um, and we relate that to experiences that we've had um, in our own personal lives that's what we bring often to an object or to an artwork or to a thing so there's an important responsibility I think if you're an artist or a designer or someone who's creative that what your intention might be um hopefully is strong enough that it can't be um you know used for something else or mis uh, misused or um, the other thing I think that's really important, um, and I think, again, this is just coming back to the project that I've just done with Jade in Manchester Art Gallery, which is still kind of ongoing, is um, when narratives are lost, you know, what do you do with, like, lost narratives? Um, what do you do when um, something becomes, like, mistitled? or that a title can be misleading or the information that's provided is, um, you know, tells um, a narrative that doesn't necessarily privilege the artist or the person who uh, the artwork is about. So I know there's a, like a lot of things there and it's, it's often, it's hard, I think, um, it must well I wonder Jade you know it must be hard releasing works into the world and hoping that what you want to convey is understood um, but I think as a curator and as an educator um, my responsibility is to look very well and to research rigorously to make sure that um, 
the kind of curatorial frame uh, that we're offering is one that supports the practice and allows for that artwork uh, or object um, um, to also, yeah, to have a to have its own voice and for it to um, for it to present as best as it can, basically, and to do the the work of instigating kind of dialogue or a conversation um, without misconstruing or misinterpreting what the intention of the artist was. Thank you. Jade, I guess in terms of your own practice, um, I know you kind of briefly touch upon um, what you do and uh, basically, but I guess it'd be really good to know in terms of how you personally, I guess, within your experience, or even the current work that you're working on at the moment, how you basically put care in it, whether that be like, have you noticed basically, you know, from when you started, when you were at the early ages of be, you being an artist, compared to where you're at now, have you noticed a shift in terms of like, are you seeing that you are, you're putting more care into certain aspects of your work or is there a much more focus on art now where there wasn't much when you were beginning and when you were starting out? Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the question. I'm putting in an article that I co-wrote into the chat. Um, so I would like to say that that article makes explicit aspects of the working conditions that I entered into um, uh, in, uh, as an artist um, that were unsustainable for me. And it took, um, yeah, until last summer to be able to fully articulate those conditions that weren't acceptable and that are replicated, um, that you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't in isolation. Um, it was a collectively written article, um, and we did indeed um, speak from a plurality of voices. So. Um, it is through necessity that I embed care into my practice. Um, and it is through experience of also working as a care worker for a short period of time with MENCAP, for instance, that allows me to understand that the, the, the issue is structural and I realised with what Sapake was saying, I, um, I think probably like an art historian or a historian to some extent in terms of I'm trying to develop a, a, a critical um, research led practice um, and that means that when Sapake was talking about how we encounter artworks, um, I come with a, a certain understanding of a historical context. So what I'm also saying care is, is obviously access to education. I, I had access to a particular type of education and I was lucky um, um, but it also erased aspects that my personal identity required in order for me to grow as a just a general human being um, that's um, uh, as um, uh, as sort of um, with that sense of belonging that I think we all need, um, that was sort of absented because of an erasure of aspects of our histories. Um, so care is also 
um, knowing that there's an education that talks about the plurality of voices from a very early age and a real um, critical understanding of nationhood as well. So I just feel that on lots of um, levels, I'm bombarded with kind of um, uncaring um, negotiations um, that actually my body, physically my body reacts to and has reacted to all my life. So I was a school refuser um, uh, uh, from when I started school um, to um, when I then became a day person. So I also went to boarding school in that time, which was really, really difficult for me to um, negotiate as being the only person of colour in a whole school it, for girls um, at age eight, seven, eight, um, nine. So when I got to about 11, I went to a day school where creativity also, it, I was, it was somewhere where I got on with my art teacher. She was kind of all embracing. Um, there was a lot of singing that went on, high, high, um, high uh, Church of England. So it was also taking on the weight of this whole, it was, an, it was a convent school. So um, I'm talking about um, care in a sort of dynamic sense whereby we're not sort of streamlined into trying to adopt these positions in society where we're free to be ourselves um, and learn um, together um, that's not exclusionary. Uh, and that also then brings us to sort of um, climate catastrophe whereby it feels like at the moment there's these blinkers and there's a it's sort of also a, a, a washing again um, so yeah, I think care is about being able to speak. Uh, so I forgot what you asked, but I've got on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> You've so. covered it all anyway, Jane. Thank you so much. Nelly's got a question. Yes, I have plenty of questions. So Sepake, um, it would be super interesting to know as well about your experience actually putting together, you know, Biennale programs around care you know around the idea of care and kind of like bringing that to life and kind of like pitching it as well to institutions what you know how does that work like how did you how did you how do you actually make it you know kind of like a combination of artwork so that they all speak at different level about what cares mean whether it's in education do you compare you know do you go for compact compartmentalizing you know this is care in education care in artwork i mean i'm sure you don't do that but what i mean is like how do you go about what's the process that you go through when you are actually trying to highlight how people develop you know practices around cares when you put an exhibition together? I mean, I think for me, I work much more like in this sort of site responsive way. So um, meaning like often the projects and the artists I'm working with are actually uh, people who have to negotiate the gallery space because for them, that's not necessarily where the work is located, like the work is located somewhere else. And actually often, the work is located, and especially in terms of thinking about this question of care, it's in the types of relationships which are nurtured. And um, and it's also very much around, I would say, um, intimacy is something that I think is so, when I talk about intimacy, I talk about the fact that like, especially in like education workshops and workshop settings or, spaces where there's conversation or dialogue taking place between more than one person, um, um, you have to set in some ways the, the way in which you're gonna speak with each other. You have to set that as a kind of ground rule because um, you cannot expect that everybody has the same socialization and same background. So it's also just recognizing um, in this place where we've decided to come together, this is how we're going to talk with each other. That's one practice of care, I would say. The other thing that I heard about the other day, I haven't exercised it yet. Um, 
someone was telling me about um, care riders. You know, like if you're a musician, you can have like a rider and it would be like, yeah, I want to have this whiskey and two glasses and make sure the glasses are cold. And I don't know what musicians say. I'm that's I'm giving some ideas. Do you want <laughs> whiskey right now, actually? Funny you mentioned that. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but, you know, I guess it's, for them, maybe it's it's about, like, you know, because there's the there's a performance that needs to be done. Um, for them to get into this space, this headspace for the performance, there's certain needs that they might have. And, you know, I want to make sure my lucky teddy is there or whatever it might be, you know, like you have your set of things that you need as a musician. Um, and I guess the care rider, I think, is something that might become a bigger practice. I think artists are starting to think about it now. I'd be curious to know if, Jade, if you're doing this. But it's like when you're invited to something, because some of your needs might be invisible, um, that you actually articulate for yourself what are the conditions that you need in order to be able to deliver your work. And the thing is, I think it's really important to do because, um, and also I think for us as an institution, I've just been thinking, when I say us, I'm talking about Innova, it'd be also important to say this is what we're able to provide because actually sometimes maybe you know we're not able to provide everything right so um i think it's a really healthy conversation to have that would allow like the artist to be able to say these are my needs and these are the things that i need in order to be able to deliver my work and the institution's able to say or whoever that person is going to be working with the artist um okay this is how we think we can meet your needs and this is probably also where we don't think we're able to meet your needs i think that's also something that's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, and it makes me also think, of, I always refer to this Mia Mingus text um, that Stacey Boucher, a curator I work with in um, at Casco in Utrecht, always refers to, and we, um, we talk about this Mia Mingus text, Access Intimacy. I'll put it into the chat. But it, for me, it really like highlighted like what it means to someone when their access um, intimacies are recognized you know without um having to highlight them but when they're like when somebody's able to accommodate you like how important that can be for the way you're able to kind of like move and be in the world so I think I think you know these are things that I think anyone can do and I think often it's about conversation and I've learned that actually we sometimes shortcut things that are embedded in practice. So, for example, um, this is, again, actually something I learned from... Is it John, the law, the lawyer, art lawyer? John Sharp... Is it Sharply, Jade? Sharples. Sharples. Yeah. So he was talking about this idea of the contract, and the contract is a way of, like... So, you you know, you agree something with someone that you want to do something together... And there's going to be some forms of exchange that might happen between you. Um, and he was like saying the contract is a way of making small. So in a, on a concise way, those things that you're going to do together, those things that you've agreed upon. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a conversation. It's not just a document. And I think what we tend to do now is that we think, Oh yeah, you need a contract. So, you know, here's the contract. That's, not necessarily the act of care that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about what it means to contract someone. It also can be too slow a process, which is, I have to say, slowness is a bit of my issue. Because I, I, will, <laughs> I will basically, you know, stalk artists for a very long time, watch their, watch their practice, what are you up to? Oh, let me come and see what you're doing here, there. And I think for some artists, they're probably thinking, why is, why is it if you want to work with me, just work with me. <laughs> but I like to, like, take my time because I'm trying to... Un I'm trying to build or understand, get a sensibility, you know, of, of an artist and understand how they're working. And um, and so, and I, I do re recognise that might be a bit stalkerish in, in behaviour, but it means that by the time I'm ready to, like, say, let's work together, like, I can, I can rightly contract someone because I know what they're, you know, able to do and I know where I would, like, maybe to push them to as well. So... 
I don't know, I suppose the care question for me is like, you have to also find your own um, way of caring. That's the other thing I wanted to say is like, that you you cannot expect that we're all going to care in the same way. I think in this, you know, have you ever heard of like love languages when people say, oh, what's your love language? I think it's something similar where you say like, for some people it might be that uh, they, like I I know I'm a huge complimenter and I just can't help myself. Like if I think someone looks fantastic, in whatever way, it could be that they're smiling, their hair is amazing, their shoes, their dress, whatever, it doesn't matter. I will, I just can't help it. I have to compliment them. And, um, and, I, and I've been with people before, they're like, why do you have to, like, you know, you don't even know that person. Why are you sort of, I was like, well, they think they should know. I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just something I wanted to share with them. For other people, like for my mum, for example, it's like, um, she won't, she, it will never be in language. You can look for a compliment from, from my mum. You will be there for a long time. But the way that she cares is like acts of service. So she'll always, like, she uses food a lot for that. So she'll cook, you know, if you're tired, here's some food. <laughs> if you're, if you're, um, if you're like, you know, upset, happy, want to celebrate whatever you know there's there's always a way of showing let's say she might um, be someone who would take you know just take very good care of something like oh I've ironed <laughs> I've ironed this thing like she'd love to like iron my underwear for example I'd be like why are you ironing my underwear like who's gonna see my underwear but that for her that she's caring that's what you know for her that's an important thing um and I think for other people, you know, it. Um, and I wonder if, how these might translate into thinking about an artistic practice. Um, so I think as someone I saw someone put touch in the, in the, uh, in the box, um, and I think, like it, it's really interesting, you know, in this time where we've been separated from each other, um, like physically, and. Um, and I realised, you know, how much I enjoy a hug. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is about a hug, but sometimes it's like it's better than language, actually, because that person doesn't have to say anything. Uh, and they might can just... I just... Can I just say what type of hug? Are we talking like, have you got a fairy tablet with the one from the back? Or no, no, side no, no, hug? A bear hug, bear hug, a going in. Bear hug. No, going proper... in. Proper bear hug, not like a little, you know. No, no, no. I mean, like, you know, you you see someone, they need that hug, and you just give them that big physical hug. It's great. How long? How long are we holding? Oh gosh. <laughs> Matches. I don't know. I mean, I think, of course, I can understand what you're saying because with some people, it can it you it can get awkward, right? But I feel like sometimes that I don't know what it I mean I, I should read about it but I feel like a hug sometimes allows for someone to release something because you know you're sort of you feel when you feel the other person like release you know it's like that, that's a, that's very special like you that you were that you can trust somebody else they're holding you so let's think about this hug now so what would that hug be curatorially what would that hug be artistically so I often talk about people holding the room I say thank you so much for holding the room um and what I mean by that is like sometimes it's like difficult conversations that are happening and they've held that space you know and holding that space has meant that they've they've had to kind of you know they've had to open up themselves so they've had to, in some ways, make themselves vulnerable for everybody else to be able to release, you know? They've held that space. So I just sort of feel like when, we, when we're thinking about curating, when we're thinking about artwork, when we're thinking about work, actually, because that's, I mean, that's, I think, you know, these are work relations mostly. Um, we have to recognise that always those relationships need to be built they need to be negotiated they need to be understood it's a 
it's an ongoing dialogue. It's, you know, forms of communication are needed. And often those relationships can break down. And, um, you know, you've got to... You have to have, I think, a lot of courage, I think, sometimes working, especially in creative field, because um, I've definitely upset people with my words. I've definitely upset people with my words. And I think it's... And and not necessarily recognising how hurtful words can be as well. Thinking that I'm being generous because I'm sharing what I think about something. So it's just recognising, I think, that, you know, every action every way of being even looking you know how we are with each other how we invite someone to do something how we close something you know all of those elements they need to be thought through considered um and hopefully if if there's there should be space for that there should be like dialogue and conversation that's what i learned i have to say i I learned a lot of this also over the like I mean, Jade, is it two years that we've had the chance to work together? But I learned so much from working with artists. I learned so much from working with Jade. And just so generous, actually, I have to say. Very generous in... Also, when something isn't right, it's also important to say it as well. And I think you also learn so much when things are not right. Probably more you learn from more from that, you know, um, than sometimes what you learn when everything is just running smoothly. So, yeah. So there is a question in the chat from Laura Gwendoline Miles. Are you around, Laura? Do you want to pop on our screen to ask your question? I'm seeing it was a question that you dropped in the chat quite early on uh, to do with our psychotherapy. Are you there with us? Do you want to talk to us? It's all good, Laura says. Um, hey, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember which. Um, I think I've I said a few things in the chat. It's been great talking with you. I'm thinking about maybe going down an art psychotherapy route, maybe in the future. But I, there's a lot of, I do have some like experiencing stuff. So I work with the Royal National Institute for Blind People. My phone's going to run out of battery. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've been walking around looking for my charger. This is awful. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to talk to you. I'm sorry. Oh, keep going, Laura, till the battery runs out. Uh, um, I don't know. I really enjoy it. It's it's really great and really uplifting to hear you and stay strong. And I love love everything that you're doing. Oh. Um, I was going to say. So you're thinking of going down the art psychotherapist route? Yeah. Don't just don't focus on me. It's going to run out. Honest. Oh. But we are recording this, so you will be able to listen to the answer as well. Post, uh, which is kind of the miracle of the internet. So you can listen to uh, say packet running. Yeah, do you want to? Um, because she she asked whether it's an important or respectable um experience, um and resistance. She asked resistance to what being manipulated, or discriminated against. Okay, so uh, so the first question around uh, um art psychotherapy. So um when I came to Innova actually there was a um curator Susan Ibrick. Do you see what Innova is as well? Oh yeah, sorry. It's Innova. Yeah, sorry. Innova stands for the Institute for International Visual Arts, and it's an organisation that has existed since 1994 um, with a specific focus, let's say, on um, caring for narratives which have often been excluded and pushed out of the canon, um, but specifically uh, recognising global majority narratives. Is that good? For, yeah? (laughs) Um, And then... The, just in terms of art therapy, Innova has worked for a long time with an organisation called A Space, which is an art therapist organisation, because they recognise that sometimes actually when doing creative practice that things might trigger, um, you know, traumatic experience or um, it might, you know, sometimes from an image, you know, things can be triggered. And so they often work with an artist and an art therapist when they do uh, workshops. And I think that's a really, it's a good strategy because I know that sometimes when things have come up in workshops that I've worked on, knowing how to, you know, um, uh, to, co- you know, to close a workshop, making sure that everyone feels okay. Uh, it's important, I think, to have someone to hand who's had very um who's been trained effectively to to be able to work uh through certain kinds of scenarios 
Do you want to speak about the fact that um, care, you know, like I know from speaking with you before that you have this fascination for everything that is in flux, that is in movement. And actually you and I, we keep on bumping in each other. I mean, back in the days when we could move, uh, we were able to just literally bump into each other at various airports in various places uh, or trains or other places. And I, I always really enjoy like actually, you not know, just like seeing how things are kind of, you know, related as well that you like to kind of go in different places, experiment with different, but anyway, like, is that part of your practice as well? Or is that, and also for you, Jade, is movement and being in flux kind of really informing your practice and supporting your practice of care somehow to be in movement? I don't know where I'm going with that, but if we want to finish on that note about movement and care, if that is of any relevance to your practice. For sure, yeah. So. I today was speaking about how I equate um, drawing and printmaking um, and paper making and book binding, all of those physical acts with my needs um, to play tennis badly or to be in the water and to swim. Um, so um, those are all sort of caring dynamics um, to do with physical movement, um, but I really um, need to dance as well. I like to go on long walks. So I'm constantly moving and moving, I suppose, towards people and then retreating from them. Um, so it, it's constantly in flux like that. Mm, over the last, I guess, couple of years, I've learned the importance of grounding, like being grounded, what it means to be grounded. <laughs> um, because I had been moving a lot and I hadn't really realised how exhausting it is moving all the time also. Uh, but... One thing I really liked, if I'm honest, about movement is like the tr being in tr transition um, would allow me like sort of thinking time and time to often uh, my ideas would come in these places. And it's funny because I think when I was much younger, I just used to just I always used to take the bus everywhere around London and everyone was like, why are you taking the bus or you take the something faster? But taking the bus it just allowed me to like adjust or transition and then often it would allow for ideas to cultivate so, um, Majid is a massive fan of buses Majid are you still on the line I think he's I think he's gone he disappeared yeah <laughs> well he wrote a full chapter in his book about buses so I would have hoped that but anyway yes buses definitely fascinating place to meet a lot of people as well yeah <laughs> um so yeah it's I think you know obviously uh yeah I think now actually I think walking does the same job um you know to be in movement and I, I mean I don't think I've had any ideas while I've been dancing Jay that's quite a nice idea though <laughs> but um yeah here we go. Majid is back to tell us a spot on time to speak about buses. Majid. No. Disappearance and appearance. What do we think about this space that we are in? Do we think that this is a, a carefree, careless space? The virtual space. How do you feel about this? I mean, I'm sure you are like this is a bigger conversation, you know, how the digital space allow for spaces of care, but I'm sure you're kind of like all over it at INIVA as well, thinking about you know how you can maybe move some programs online or not. Uh, where do you both sit with this? Um, well, we had to like put some like protocols in place because actually initially we didn't really know how to care for ourselves on this space so things like you know just length of time that you're on the screen like taking breaks also being okay to turn off your camera like you know there was a whole bunch of things that we just needed to learn and 
it's weird. Like now, obviously, conversation it flows a bit better. But initially, also like you'd have like everyone talking at the same time. You know, like so just trying to find ways in which to like navigate that space. But I think now pretty fluid. I think now. Majid, we were talking about buses. Do you want to share your experience of being in the bus? <laughs> See, I'm my favorite bus. <laughs> there is really, I mean, what Nelly's basically alluding to is that I just, I'm just a big fan of buses and in general. I think there's a lot of care and compassion that can come from buses. You get to meet people from all walks of life, all, not all going to the same destination, but taking the same route and to that destination. But it's, yeah, there's lots of um, kindness that can come from buses, basically. But um, just a quick question in terms of, like, for Jade. On the back of what you call it, Nelly's question, in terms of, um, with, I guess, with a lot of digital work, because I know you do a lot of, like, physical work as well, but you find that the digital artwork, people tend to engage with, that a, bit, with a bit more care compared to actual physical, physical stuff, because I appreciate watching art or seeing art through an online lens, through a digital lens, is completely different than actually seeing it in a physical sense kind of thing. So in what way do you think that the pandemic has shifted that narrative at all? Thank you. Um, I think that... Um, there's more, this, I don't, I hope I can do your question justice. Sorry, I'm just trying I to- It's a random question. Like, uh, I just spit my breath, I just like whatever comes to mind. Thank I'm just, you. just yeah. curious. I'm, yeah, I'm just um, thinking it through. Um, but I was wanting to mention, I suppose, um, a comment that came up last night at a talk that, um, I attended to do with the Climate Justice Museum that's going to be part of Manchester Art Gallery. Um, and um, my friend Jane Lawson was speaking at it, so I, and her talk was just excellent. What came what up? Her name, sorry, sorry, said Jane Lawson, Jane Lawson. Um, and it's the Climate. Um, museum, I think that's what it's called, something um, like that. I'll find the events and put it in the chat. Um, what came up in the questions was that art is a sort of, art galleries can be exclusionary, I think was what they were saying, but there was this emphasis on um, having too much um, uh, complicated information for people to distill. Um, and so I suppose what, sh what shifted is that, that that person last night could be part, could speak to the people directly who are, um, not that they wouldn't have gone to a in-person event previously, but that there's some, there is something democratic or perhaps more democratic about entering this digital space than, um, than it, assuming that everyone, because we might feel comfortable going into certain spaces, um, assuming that everyone feels that and they don't clearly, um, or, um, and then about allowing critique of those spaces to then inform, I suppose, how we use those spaces in the future, maybe. Um, sorry, I don't think I've properly answered your question, which was about um, care, though, whether I found there's more care on in, in these digital spaces, but um, I mean, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't. Well, I guess to be fair, it's still so relatively new that we're all still trying to figure it out in all honesty. I don't think anyone 
truly knows basically no, i don't think that that could be true it can't it, it can't possibly because it's fact it it's not a caring space it's a it's a functional space it allows us to communicate with one another it's really helpful mm. but there is this remove always that means that if someone is requiring a, a, a hug um that it we can't affect that we have to mm. we've got this interface and always definitely no i mean i think it also just depends on the type of pe person it is because you're right of course ideally in terms of connection and care you'd want to have that physical presence but say for somebody who lives in south africa the fact that they can now digitally join and kind of connect with someone for them that's a lot of care and it's amazing of course you can't physically be there but it's just having the option is basically there. But anyway, guys, I'm very cautious of the time. Please all join me in giving a massive warm round of applause and just a big thank you in all honesty and a lot of care to Sepake and Jade. Thank you. And just a final and final quick plug and shout out. As you can see, I've pasted in the group chat and the website for all the amazing and money that we're giving away for all the amazing projects that we're actually building around Tordy Moon. So please do check it out and share with all your family and friends as well. On that note, thank you very much.